Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Um, uh, my name is An Xiaomina. You can call me An, and I'm a, um, a product designer um, and a researcher, independent researcher and writer, um, and based in the Bay, um, but um, originally from LA, so I'm, I'm psyched to be back here. Um, I should st start my timer. Um, and uh, today I'm talking about um, you know, different sorts of divides, uh, but specifically around language divides. Um, and uh, it's a sort of uh, biases around language that, um, that exists in our, our technologies and our, our um, technological spaces. Um, I want to take, take a moment to imagine um, you know, sort of this, this next billion of, you know, group of people who are coming online and uh, the sort of languages, the sheer diversity of languages that they're speaking. Um, it's hundreds and thousands of different languages. And um, one language might be Khmer, um, a Cambodian language. Um, and um, a colleague of mine, a researcher, um, Ben Valentine, um, Pointed out that when he um, he's based in Cambodia and he's uh, when he's uh, looking for um, you know um, looking at Khmer websites uh, with uh, certain browsers, um, the very language which has its own custom script appears like this. Um, it looks like boxes. So the, the literally the language of Khmer is uh, is invisible to many technologies. Um, and um, it's just it's just one example of how the language that you speak shapes the internet that you have access to, um, both as a reader and as a listener, um, as a as a reader and as a speaker. Um, you know. Uh, take a moment to, you know, to, you know, when we think about network graphs and we talk about um, how, um, you know, the, the kind of network effects that, um, that make up an important part of how social movements and how information is distributed online, um, there's this assumption um, in, in those visualizations that every node in that network is equal. Um, but um, very often, and, um, and you, can, you can slice data in many different ways, but um, the languages that we speak um, actually limit the networks that we have access to and that we, we're, we're, um, we're interacting with. Um, this is a visualization from uh, 2010 um, by um, uh, Mike McCandless, um, who had, um, who's a, a researcher who, who uh, uh, scraped the Twitter data for the languages that people are speaking um, based on their geolocation and the, the, you know, the location that they're tweeting from. Um, and then Eric Fisher then visualized this. And you can see how the languages that people are speaking, each, each color represents a, a, a different language um, that actually falls along geopolitical lines. Um, that, um, um, and, um, and this is not, you know, this is not people, you know, just sticking to, you know, speaking Italian because they're in Italy. It, it's, and, and, you know, and it's not, we're not visualizing what people are speaking based on this, this map. It's actually, the language itself creates the, recreates the map um, of, of Europe, and you can um, expand this um, into um, with other countries and other regions as well. Um, this this can have an effect. Um, you know, one one specific example of this. Um, so much so often, uh, we, um, people talk about the importance of Wikipedia and the importance of open knowledge um, and open um, open access to knowledge and the ability to contribute to a collective uh, database of knowledge. Um, and um, Wikipedia has um, built-in translation features that allows people to contribute language and translation. But again, if you're speaking a minority language, um, your access to to that knowledge is, it can be severely limited. Um, these are the numbers of articles available um, for different languages. If you're speaking majority language. Um, and or languages where people have made a concerted effort to translate that content um, give access to millions of articles and a, it's a it's a great database um, but if you're speaking um, you know um, you know especially minority Asian and African languages that number starts to drop significantly um, 10,000 for Afrikaans Tagalog Kiswahili hundred and down to a hundred and um, for for um, um, uh, small even smaller minority languages we can kind of expect those same patterns, I think, um, uh, moving back. We can expect similar patterns, I think, with other websites and other, other sorts of content. Um, and uh, um, Wikipedia just being one example. And then um, in addition to reading, it's also the access to voice. I think a lot of us um, are familiar with the role of the internet in building social movements and the ability to amplify one's voice. Um, you know, um, certainly the umbrella movement um, in Hong Kong um, and, uh, and Black Lives Matter here in the US rely on the ability to, to broadcast a message, to use hashtags, to, um, to amplify a voice and create a pipeline from, um, from social media to mainstream media and then hopefully to, um, to other audiences. Um, and, and certainly we've seen, you know, um, we can think about like major hashtags and major, major movements um, um, that have been in English or in a majority language. Um, you know, Tweet Like a Foreign Journalist in Kenya um, was, it's, um, was, uh, um, was it a critique of, of media, uh, media coverage of East Africa. Um, and then Je suis Charlie, um, you know, simple enough French phrase for people to remember and to understand. Um, but there are a number of other movements, um, and I think the chairs are actually, I, I hope you guys can see that, so it's kind of fitting actually. Um, um, there are a number of other movements in other languages that um, are more difficult to understand, more difficult to, um, uh, 
um, and get a significantly less attention. Sasufi in um, um, in Congo. There's a Gao movement that's part of it's part of the Hong Kong umbrella movement, but um, is a sort of separate a separate group um, with with um, sort of different aims and strategies. Um, Luma Dinako that's um, in the Philippines, and then um, this Arabic hashtag means Egypt delights. It's kind of a, a parody on on um, um, a parody hashtag, which I'll talk about a little later. Um, these sorts of these sorts of movements and conversations um, are often limited to the language sphere that they that they're in um, because they're they're often working with uh, minority languages. And just to illustrate this even further, um, I, I just love this quote from uh, Sarah Kenzior, um, who's a, a, a writer on social justice in um, both uh, Middle America and Central Asia. And she's speaking about the, the kind of quandaries um, that, um, that a Uzbek activist might have to go through to raise awareness for their cause. Um, Uzbek. Um, you know, um, and I just want to read through the whole de the whole description because it, it really shows you some of the the challenges with amplifying voice when your language is not um, you know when your language has um, it's not very well represented in um, in technological platforms and also is um, you know is, is doesn't there's no pipeline for translating those languages um, into um, into mainstream and majority media. Um, so the Uzbek activist um, might know Russian or Uzbek, um, and so if she knows Russian, she has to decide whether writing in Russian and potentially reaching an international audience, as well as the 41% of Uzbeks who can read Russian, outweighs not being able to reach non-Russian speaking Ube Uzbeks or seeming to value a foreign language over one's native tongue. So even the decision to, to speak Russian over Uzbek, even though there are benefits to that amplification, there are political consequences to, to not speaking in Uzbek. But then even if she writes in Uzbek, she has to choose which alphabet. Um, and here's, here's, here's where the, the availability of fonts, typography, and input systems of the Uzbek language um, have consequences for, um, for political action. Um, if she, you know, does she choose a Cyrillic to reach older generations in Uzbeks in neighboring former Soviet republics who only know the Cyrillic version of their language? Or does she choose a Latin alphabet to reach, to reach the younger readers who comprise the bulk of Uzbekistan's internet users? So these sorts of dilemmas are much more common when you're, when, when you're speaking a minority language, especially if that language has um, non-Latin script. So in terms of, um, you know, I've, I've, um, as a designer as well and a, pro and a um, you know, product thinker, it's, it's, I'm also thinking about what are potential solutions. And I just, um, for provocation and, and for conversation, I wanted to throw out some potential ideas for, what, for how we can think about um, a, you know, improving language inclusion, language access um, across the world, and also here, I think, um, in the United States where um, people are speaking many different languages. I think one of the one of the possibilities here is, is uh, crowdsourcing, and, and crowdsourcing certainly has a lot of problematics. Um, but when you think about the possibilities of translation, machine translation um, is can scale very quickly, but it's often inaccurate, uh, right? Um, and um, anyone who's who's um, done translations, even between English and Spanish, it's uh, leads to much hilarity. Um, at the same time, the translation model as currently exists just simply cannot scale for um, for the way that we're um, for the sort of content and sort of conversations um, that need to be translated. Um, and um, you know, again, crowdsourcing can have its problems. Um, this, this is not a crowdsourced uh, subtitle. This was actually a um, um, you know, very uh, famous meme of all your base or belong to us. Um, but it's, it's a sort of risk that happens when fan, when, uh, fan subbing communities um, you know, translate um, um, media, um, you know, uh, popular fan subbing is uh, fan subtitling. Um, so um, an example of, of translating um, anime movies into English or translating American English movies into Chinese um, uh, can be done by communities. Um, but um, you have to have a great deal of faith and trust that those translations will be accurate. Um, at the same time, there, there's, um, you know, the fan summing communities can be very, very quite successful, and, um, and there are form more formalized uh, ways of, of doing crowdsourced translation that are also um, seem to be having some uptake. Um, TED has uh, the Open Translation Project where they um, you know, hundreds of, uh, you know, hundreds of volunteers um, and who are translating into hundreds of languages um, can translate these videos, and that's, um, um, and we can see similar examples um, with, uh, with uh, sites like, um, like wiki.com uh, where, um, where people are, um, can translate Translate content, um, and I think there is a, you know part of the risk of crowdsourcing, of course, is that the, the risk of free labor, um, and I think we need to talk about what what uh, what uh, you know fair compensation looks like. But um, at the same time, um, a, a broader model for translation um, can um, can be um, can help um, help uh, ensure that content uh, reaches other languages. Um, EN in, um, in China um, is, uh, is another crowdsourced site where people are translating, um, um, have, were translating um, articles um, from English into Chinese um, as an important way of, of um, increasing access for um, uh, sites like The Economist. Um, it was shut down and then it's, it's kind of at a, um, a neutral space right now, but um, it's, it's an example of the potential for this. 
Um, and then my own experience is um, is building a light platform for um, translating the, the Chinese artist Ai Weiwei um, from Chinese into English um, with uh, his, and his tweets, um, which um, you know back in 2009, 2010 um, were um, were very rarely um, understood by English-speaking media, um, despite the fact that he had a major media presence. Um, and um, and you know um, this is, is this model kind of shows that um, you know maybe just five translators can have an impact um, with uh, 31,000 followers. Um, so um, it doesn't take a lot, um, but it does take motivation. It does take interest. Um, and we're trying to uh, productize that with a, um, um, at Midan uh, with a product called Bridge, um, where um, that allows for crowdsourced translation around social media. And secondly, we need to change the structures. The language inequity, it's a, it's a full stack problem. Um, I think um, you can translate all the things, but if your language is not supported, if your fonts, um, um, and this is Amharic, um, you know, the Amharic um, alphabet uh, with um, over, I think, believe over 300 um, you know, uh, letters or um, alpha, sy alpha syllables. Um, and um, um, the, the, we have to design better ways to input the, these languages. We need to design better ways to read them, to access them. Um, and uh, um, you know, we, we just need better, um, a better structure for supporting languages, ensuring that they can be read and input. Um, especially on mobile devices. Um, you know, one, one possibility, um, and this is a picture of Leo Messi um, uh, interacting with an app called WeChat, um, is we also need to think about audio interactions um, and audio input. Um, you know, um, and uh, a, research, a researcher friend of mine, Christina Shi, has pointed out that QR codes are very popular in China um, as a form of input because typing in, a bit, very active typing in a Chinese URL can be burdensome. And so it's much easier to take a screenshot of a, of a QR code. So we need to think about different interactions. And especially when we get to languages that may not have a formal written form or any written form, audio, audio interaction and, and oral, um, oral engagement through, um, through technology, I think will be, um, will be uh, very uh, critical and important. And just um, just to close, I'll, I'll just give one example of um, you know this has been a very, um, is of the set of color that um, that can be um, exposed through translation and why this can be um, both a very exciting but um, and uh, and um, and interesting and and I think it's you know this really this process of building our global imaginations that our ability to empathize and interact and um, and value um, people from other cultures um, in different parts of the world that um, can often be invisible to the West um, is is through um, through through bringing out that citizen content, bringing out content that can be interesting and valuable. Um, and uh, um, this is just one, um, one example, the um, 2011, um, the Wenzhou tra train crash in China um, was a major train crash where um, you know, hundreds of people were killed and injured. Um, and, um, and this was the sort of event that would have been censored in, um, in Chinese media um, uh, because uh, um, it was a, a sort, of, sort of example of uh, potentially of government mismanagement. Um, but the role of social media in, 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 bringing, in bringing this out um, was so compelling. Um, and actually telling the specific stories of this um, is a way of, of highlighting um, you know, how, how and why um, you know, um, how and why translation you know, the, these, um, these online engagements can be um, quite powerful. Um, and, uh, and it really takes translation, though, to, to highlight these. Um, this, was, this was one image where someone photoshopped this um, into, um, you know, into this uh, sort of uh, you know, monster movie. And, um, and you can see that it's kind of the parody conversations. I'd rather believe this in the official explanation for the train crash. Um, you know, there's different sorts of memes. You cannot escape the blame of profaning the dead. Um, time to disembark, we're home. These kind of poetic messages. And uh, this was a friend of mine who had photoshopped the train ticket, starting point hell, destination hell. And that specificity um, that, um, of, trans of translating this content um, and uh, bringing it out um, becomes an important act of journalism, I would say. Um, so I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to um, skip the uh, the ones about um, Egypt. But um, just to close, I think um, you know, as we, we think about uh, the uh, you know the uh, the role of language on the internet, it really biases our our experience. Um, and uh, um, and there's certain um, there are a lot of a lot of uh, risks and challenges there, especially for um, as as people from um, you know the global south are are coming online. The ability for them to access content and for them to contribute to important conversations online will be severely limited. It'll look more like this, um, and uh, I. Think I think you know some um, some of the most important work we can do in tech is to um, to bring it out into languages that they can understand. So, um, thank you so much. Thank you.